the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Oriental Magic by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Chapter 12. Magical Rites of the Atharva Veda A curse with a thousand eyes comes, wheel-born, and it seeks him that curses me, like a wolf seeks the dwelling of the owner of sheep. Strike he that curses me, O curse, him do I cast to his death. Veda 4, 637 That the Atharva Veda of the Brahmins, the secret work, is a textbook of magic will be obvious from the extracts presented here. Originally memorized by Brahmin priests and supposed to be used only after purification and dedication rites, the spells of the largely magical Atharva Veda are believed to be efficacious by millions of Hindus. Originally called the Brahma Veda, Book for Brahmins, its status, according to Hindu theology, is lower than the three Vedas, hence the title of Fourth Veda sometimes applied to it. What is more important to realize is that it is not regarded as a work of witchcraft or sorcery. Among the spells included are several which actually curse magicians and others which seek to arm the Brahmin priest with effective counters to the magic working of others. Thus, from the Brahmin point of view, the Veda is white or legitimate magic. While the usual difference between the two is taken to be the degree to which actual evil is encouraged, the Atharva Veda strikes at the root of the magical problem. Where a spell can cause either good or evil, depending on the purpose for which it is used, Is it black or white magic? The theory that black magic is connected with Satan worship is a later Christian opinion, which was at its height during the Inquisition and the reign of such monarchs as James I of England. According to the beliefs of the compilers of the Veda, magic is not only true, but lawful when applied by those pure in heart. This is the main reason why for centuries the Atharva Veda was only read to select initiates. These extracts form an interesting study of the scope and purpose of magical practice among the Vedic Brahmins. Spell for Everlasting Life Immortality be upon this one. He is a sharer of the sun's everlasting life. Indra and Agni have blessed him and have taken him into immortality. Bhaga and Soma are with him, carrying him high to prolong his days. There will now be no danger of death. This world will keep you forever. Rise up. The sun, the wind, the rain are all with thee. Thy body shall be strong and unaffected by any disease. Life will be thine, I promise it. Enter this ascending, never-perishing, age-old chariot. Thy heart will be strong, thou shalt be apart from others. Forget those who have died, they are no longer for thee. The twin, many-coloured dogs of Yama, guards of the road, shall not follow thee to take thy life. Follow the path where the fire will guide thee, the purifying flame, and it will not harm thee, this celestial burning. Savitar the saver will guard thee, taking into converse the great Vayu of the living Indra, and strength and breath shall be with thee. The spirit of life will ever remain. No illness shall touch thee. All powers are on thy side. By a variety of efforts I have rescued thee, Henceforth there will not be any danger, nor death, nor disease. This spell, like the others in the Veda, is chanted by the Brahmin before the man who desires everlasting life. 
The next charm is used if the operator himself wishes his days prolonged. Take hold of this charm that subjects to immortality. May thy life unto old age not be cut off. I bring to thee a new breath and life. Go not to mist and darkness. Do not waste away. Come hither to the light of the living. I rescue thee unto a life of a hundred autumns. Loosing the bands of death and imprecation, I bestow upon thee long life extended very far. From the wind thy breath I have obtained, from the sun thine eye. Thy soul I hold fast in thee. Be together with thy limbs, speak articulating with thy tongue. With the breath of two-footed and four-footed creatures I blow upon thee, as on Agni when he is born. I have paid reverence, O death, to thine eyes, reverence to thy breath. This person shall live and shall not die. We rouse him to life. I make for him a remedy. O death, slay not this man. The plant quickening, forsooth no harm, a victorious, mighty saviour plant do I invoke, that he may be exempt from injury. Befriend him, do not seize him, let him go, though he be thy very own, let him stay here with unimpaired strength. O Bhava and Sava, take pity, grant protection, misfortune drive away and life bestow. Befriend him, death, pity him, let him rise unaided. Through old age over a hundred years, let him be well. Health Charms and Invocations As with other magical systems, the Arthava Veda holds that while certain plants and trees possess healing and other supernatural powers, these functions can only be exercised subject to certain conditions. Knowing the kind of herb to employ for each spell is not enough. The plant must be exorcised, invocations made to the spirit residing within it, and the usual requirements of ritual purity and prayer observed. In treating disease, much depends upon the diagnosis. Specific complaints, coughs, lameness, blindness, have their known cures. Diseases caused by demons, however, must be combated in accordance with the formulas laid down in the Veda for this purpose. If the cause of the illness is not known, Recourse is made to universal panaceas. Those who are apparently healthy call to their aid either elixirs of life or charms to produce complete immunity from all disease. In all cases, however, the magical plants and remedies must be addressed in suitable terms. This is the first step undertaken by all Hindu magicians working according to the discipline of the Atharva Veda. Invocation to the Plants We invoke and address the magical plants, plants that are red, those that are white, and the brown and black herbs, all these do we invoke. Verily the spirits are in control of the infirmities. Herbs rooted in the seas, mothered by the land, fathered by the sky. Plants and herbs of the heavens, illness and maladies coming from sinfulness do you exorcise. I call upon the creepers, upon those plants that bear luxurious foliage. These are herbs that give us life. They multiply by division of their stems. They are vigorous. They have strong shoots. O plants and herbs, you have the power to rescue this sufferer. I call upon you and adjure you to make the remedy that I shall prepare powerful and effective. Certain plants are then gathered. Very often their family is not so important as their appearance. Ailments which cause swellings are believed to be alleviated by herbs with bulbous roots. Those who have the jaundice can be cured by invocations to yellow leaves and so on. When the requisite number of leaves and roots have been collected, they may be addressed, as in this instance of a panacea for all ills. Panacea for all ills it is these plants, these highly endowed ones, which shall liberate the sufferer. Verily I acknowledge, O herbs, that your Lord is Soma, 
and that you are made by none other than Brihaspati. The shadow that is over us, that threatens us, shall be overcome. We demand release from ills. From curses and the snares of Varuna we claim freedom. From the shackles of Yama and from the consequences of our sins against the spirits. We have committed sins of thought or of speech against the gods. Let these be expunged from us. Let us be free of ills. The Talisman of Force Considered one of the most potent of all charms is that made from the wood of the Sraktia tree, the Clerodendrum flumoides. A piece of the wood is cut, then shaped into something representing the object of one's desire. For victory in battle, the supplicant fashions a sword or spear from the wood. In many cases, however, a simple disc is made, bearing radiating lines to indicate the chakra, an ancient Indian sun sign. Theoretically, the wood of this tree is credited with a wide variety of virtues, embracing almost every sphere of human ambition. In the secret writings, however, its use is generally limited to protection, fecundity, virility, prosperity and defence against witchcraft. When completed, the charm is tied on the right arm. The hymn addressed to the charm itself varies with the effect wanted, though the very possession of such a charm is believed to grant many of the powers associated with its traditional virtues. This is the protection spell used in conjunction with the talisman. Protection spell of the Sraktia charm. Bound upon the owner, this charm is all-powerful. It makes the possessor strong and brave, kills enemies, brings fortune to him who has it. It is potent, too, against all magic. This is the charm used by Indra to kill Vritra. He smashed the Azuras and became master of heaven and earth, and with its aid he overcame the four spheres of space. Yes, this talisman is an attacking and a victorious one. It will destroy the enemy and will protect us from him. This is what Agni and Soma have said. Indra, Brihaspati and Savita all concur in this. Those who attack me will be repelled, and the same force as they use shall rebound upon them by the force of this talisman. Heaven, earth, the sun, the sages, all shall stand between me and my enemy. Their force shall rebound upon them by the force of this talisman. This talisman is to me and other users as is an all-powerful armour. It ascends the spheres like the sun rising into heaven, destroys all magic against me. It is a potent force, and the Rashas will fall before it. Indra, Vishnu, Savita, Rudra, Agni, Prajapati, Parameshthin, Viraj, Vaisvanara, all of them, the powerful spirits, shall stand behind the amulet which is affixed to the wearer as a powerful armour. O most potent tree, potent like a leader amongst beasts, thou art my guardian and my help, such did I need, such have I found. And I, wearing this charm, am like a tiger, like a bull, like unto a lion, nothing can touch me, wearer of this charm. He who wears it can command all and be their ruler. Produced and made by Cassiapa, worn by Indra in his battles, surely he is a vanquisher. It is the power of the spirits that makes this amulet one of power multiplied a thousandfold. O Indra, with a whip of a hundred lightning flashes, strike him who would seek to strike me by virtue of this charm. And this great and powerful talisman does strike to victory wherever it is used. It produces children. Fecundity, security, fortunes. Those who are against us in the north, in the south, in the west, in the east, uproot them, O Indra. My protection, like an armour, is the sun, the day and night, the heavens and the earth. My protection is Indra and Agni. Data will give me that protection. 
Every spirit that there is cannot pierce the defences of Indra and Agni. This is the strength that I have between me and the enemy. O spirits, let me become old and not be cut off in my youth. Nothing can happen to the wearer of this amulet. It is the very talisman of invulnerability. If the talisman is being given to someone by a sorcerer, the master will end his recital with the words, This is the all-potent talisman, O Indra, giver of prosperity, killer of Ritra, overlord of enemies, the conqueror, safeguard against all peril. Protect this man and grant him thy help by day and night. Sometimes an offering of butter is made. If it is desired to use the amulet in war, a fire of broken arrows is kindled before it to symbolize the destruction of the foe. This ritual is closely paralleled in Semitic magic. The Babylonians too made ceremonial destruction of war symbols their victory rite, even to the offering of butter, invoking Ishtar, Shamash and Nergal. Occult Medicine of the Veda According to the Atharva Veda, most diseases can be rapidly cured by spells. Spell against sores The sores upon the neck, or wherever the sore may be, will disappear. These are the 55 sores, and the 77 sores, and the 99 sores. They shall all disappear. While the repetition continues, and it should be said seventy times, fifty-five leaves of the parasu plant are lighted with some burning pieces of wood. The oozing sap of the leaves is then collected, as far as may be possible, into a cup and applied to the sores. Then a balm composed of the saliva of a dog, ground seashells and stings from insects is rubbed into the affected place. But perhaps more attractive to the general spell-minded public is one designed to combat all evil, to banish disease of whatever origin. Spell against all evil. Release me, evil power. Please release me, the unfortunate victim of your malice. Let me escape this evil thing and be happy again. If you do not release me, then I will abandon you at the next crossroads, and you will follow and possess another. Go, follow another, join the man who is my enemy, strike him. The manufacture of this spell is complicated by the ritual which supplements its recitations. These are repeated at night, while dried corn is sieved, then discarded. The following day, the invocant throws three small offerings of food into running water as a sacrifice to the spirit of a thousand eyes. Repairing to a crossroads, he then scatters three portions of cooked rice there as bait for the evil to enter, prior to its taking up a new abode in the body of the enemy to whom it will be consigned. Spell Against Poison Poison, says the Veda, can be combated by this ritual. First, the spell is recited in a low voice, while bowing to an idol representing the serpent god Takshaka. During this, the patient drinks a small quantity of water, while water is also sprinkled upon him. This water has been specially prepared by soaking it in a piece of the Krimuka tree. Next, an old garment is heated and plunged into another vessel of water, which the patient has to drink also. Some mix the two drinks with clarified butter and stir the whole with the shafts of poisoned arrows. It is perhaps not surprising that the patient is expected to become sick after these ceremonies. This is the spell to be recited. Brahmana, drinking of the sacred Soma, he of the ten heads and ten mouths, rendered all poison without power. I have announced throughout the breadth of the heavens and earth, throughout all space, the power of this charm. Garutamant, the eagle, drank of the poison, but it was powerless against him. 
In a like manner I have deflected the power of the poison, as an arrow is deflected. O arrow, thy point and thy venom have no power. Equally all those concerned in the making and use of this poison, those too have I rendered impotent. Even the crags upon which the plants of poison grow have become powerless before me. Everything of this poison is negatived. Poison, thy power is gone. Charms Against Disease and Demons The Artharvan magician has to guard against disease and demons, the former on behalf of his clients, often the ancient kings and their families, the latter because they might affect the power of his magic adversely. The following charm is said to be effective against both types of menace and against illness caused by malignant spirits as well. It represents a formidable challenge to hostile forces. A charm is first made from the Gangida tree, and over it this spell is intoned. The seers, while speaking the name of Indra, gave the man to Gangida. It had been made a remedy by the gods from the beginning, and a destroyer of the Vishkanda. Protect us, Gangida, for we look after his treasures. Verily the gods and the Brahmanas made him a protection that nullifies evil forces. I have approached the evil eye of the inimical. O thousand-eyed one, destroy all these. Gangida, thou art our refuge. The Gangida will protect me from the heavens, from the earth, from plants, from the air, and from the past and from the future. I am to be protected in every direction. May the all-powerful, protective Gangida render all the magic of gods and men weak and powerless. This quotation, apart from its interest as typical of the protective type of Hindu spell, tells us that such is the power of the Gangida tree that even spells cast by gods cannot have effect against it. Here we note the merging of magic into a power almost of its own, a power that seems to exist apart from that merely borrowed from gods and men. This is a point which, I think, has been insufficiently noted by many commentators on magical practice. It has often been remarked that the typical sorcerer will first appeal to gods, then repudiate them or threaten them if the spell does not succeed. This occurs, too, in the conjurations of the Jews. Surely it is an extension of this idea that the god or being which is addressed is not the ultimate power invoked. In later codices where Christian formulae have been substituted for earlier ones, this is made clear enough. Equally, then, it could be maintained that the pagan gods or spirits called upon to serve the sorcerer are merely acting as intermediaries or agents for the power by whose mandate magic is exercised. What is this greater power? It may or may not refer to the subconscious unitarian yearning in man. This raises theological issues, but it could prove a fertile field of study, if only occultists and even anthropologists would venture off the beaten track. That is to say, if they would cease to be content with merely cataloguing the observations of others. In the final analysis, it should be noted that charms and spells are not always of themselves certain to effect a cure. This explains why several charms for achieving the same result are prescribed in the magical writings. If, then, a charm does not work, is another tried, and so on, until a cure is found? I asked this question of the Brahmin priest who was my guide to the magical codices of Hinduism. He replied that this was a western, empirical, and cart-before-the-horse method. According to the established view, a cure is not only possible, but certain. It may be, however, that certain planetary influences are suitable for one type of incantation and not another. Or it may be that one kind of demon causes one disease and one another. These facts should be known to every practitioner of occult medicine. Hence the variety of charms and amulets employed in various circumstances. This practitioner then quoted the following alternative exorcism of disease. Varana Tree Exorcism 
This disease shall be cut off by the divine force of the Varana tree. So too will the gods shut off this disease. I am shutting off this disease by command of Indra, by command of Mitra, and by Varuna and all the gods. Just as Vritra held fast these ever-flowing waters, thus do I shut off disease from this person, with the power of Agni Vaisvanara. Certain plants, as well as water and barley, are important adjuncts to the power of incantations and amulets. In order to bring out the latent power in these objects, they have to be consecrated and sensitized. The very fact that the magician has such magical elements in his home will cause the occult power to be attracted and to build up in intensity day by day. This is the general oration made over fresh water and barley. This barley was ploughed with force, and there were used yokes of eight and of six. Ailments will be driven off with it. As the wind blows downwards, the sun shines downwards, downwards comes the milk from the cow, thus let the ailments that can be healed by this pass away. Water is healing, water drives off illness, water cures all ills, these waters will make a cure for thee. Him to the plants. When magical plants are gathered fresh for curative purposes, this hymn is chanted over them. We invoke brown, white, speckled, coloured and black plants. They are to protect this person from ills sent by the gods. Their father is the sky, mother the earth, root the ocean. Heavenly plants drive forth sinful disease. The plants that spread forth, plants that are bushy, some with a single sheath, and those that are creepers, these I do invoke. I call the plants that have shoots, plants that have stalks, those that cause their limbs to be divided, those that have been made by the gods, strong ones that give life to man. With the might that is yours, ye mighty ones, with the power and the force that is yours, with that do ye, O plants, rescue this man from his ill health. I am now making the remedy. The plants Givala, Nagrisha, Givanti, and the plant Aruntati, which takes away ills, is flowering, and I call upon them to help him. The wise plants are to come here. They understand what I am saying, and we may come together to bring this man safely to good health. They are the food of the fire, the children of the water, they grow and regrow, strong, healing plants with a thousand names, brought all together here. Prickly plants thrust aside evil. Plants that act against witchcraft shall come here. Plants which have been bought, which protect animals and men, they shall come. The tops, the ends, the middles of all these plants are steeped in honey, and they shall all even unto thousands, aid against death and suffering. The talisman made of plants is like a tiger. It will protect against hostility. It will drive off all disease. Diseases will flow away along the rivers. These invocations continue for several lines, invoking all manner of gods and powers, speaking of classical instances in Indian mythology, wherein great victories were won and lost, the thundering voice of the magician relentlessly carries on his struggle to bring together all the powers that he can invoke. As he sways backwards and forwards on his haunches, the Brahmin must nod his head with the rhythm of the recitation, and he should feel the power derived from the plants perceptibly growing inside his body. It has been described to me as a real physical feeling.
This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.